맛있는 것들을 많이 듣고 있으니까 hopefully it will be nourishing to ourselves and our ministries. Um, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Reverend Wen Hajima. Uh, I'll read the introduction and add a little bit of uh, add a little bit to that. Uh, she's a niece and granddaughter of Japanese American pastors, and she has served God as an advocate for battered women, was a manager for Apple, a pastor in Hawaii and uh, Altadena, California, and most recently as an executive presbyter for the Presbytery of Sa uh, San Gabriel in California. I met Wendy in, two, I believe, 2017 uh, at a conference by the PCUSA for Immigrant Women Leader Leadership, which was in Daytona, Florida. And it was so exciting for me to meet her. Uh, and I don't know if you're aware, Wendy, but it's great to see uh, representation and to see, wow, Asian American women in leadership position uh, as an executive presbyter at the church, uh, representation really matters. And so they say that after Pakseri, um, won her titles, like there were Seri's Ser kids or Seri kids uh, who went into golf. And so uh, I don't know if we could have Wendy's kids, but um, just by the fact that you're there, whether you realize it or not, uh, you are making a difference. And so I'm very excited and um, very privileged to be introducing you. Uh, she did ministry in Hawaii for about 10 years, then was an associate dean. Um, of, I can't read my handwriting. Yes, I do, um, but I don't know, you were an associate dean of, sorry, enrollment in San Francisco Theological Seminary, and then was at the Pacific Presbytery as a stated clerk. And currently, uh, again, she is the executive presbyter at the, uh, the Presbytery of San Gabriel. So at this time, I would like to introduce and welcome uh, Reverend Wendy Tajima for her seminar. <laughs> Oh, you all came back. Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> Thank you. You're so polite. <laughs> I, 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 I totally am preparing myself for the fact that, you know, lunch is kind of hit and it's a little warm in the sanctuary. So if you need to take a nap, that's fine with me. <laughs> okay, um, we're going to start with scripture. So I invite you the first uh, screen I will read and then the next screen uh, we can all read together. As you see, it's from Jeremiah, and I think it's a pretty um, familiar passage for us. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother the court officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the artisans and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, son of Shaphan and Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom King Zedekiah of Judah sent to Babylon to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And he said, Post the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, and live in them, plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city for I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future 
with hope. And the short passage that I think we all know from Acts. So when they had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of our God. So, yes, hello, everybody. I am really honored. I am intimidated. <laughs> and um, but I'm, I'm it's been a real blessing. Actually, it's been a blessing for me to prepare this because unlike uh, the scholars, I did not have the material at hand. <laughs> and so I had to do a little bit of research. And it was a great opportunity for me to actually reflect on my people's experience as Japanese uh, Presbyterians in America. I have also told you that I'm also very um, humble that you would actually sit here and listen to me. Um, so all I want to do is to just talk a little bit about my background and my family's background. And if there's anything that's of use to you, take it. And if not, just let it go. So um, I'd ask you, let's start in prayer. Holy God, in your magnificent creativity, you create all the peoples of the earth, and you call us to reflect your glory through our gifts and our foibles. Thank you for entrusting us with your mission to share the good news of Jesus Christ with all the world. May our time together today and every day demonstrate to a divided world that your love conquers all. And may I be true to your Holy Spirit and may all our deliberations through this symposium be led by you and only you. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So, as I said, I'm not a scholar, and so I'm going to uh, read from Marcus Hansen, uh, who is, was a scholar. He's been an influential writer on the immigrant experience. Uh, so this is long, so bear with me. The sons and the daughters of the immigrants were really in a most uncomfortable position. They were subjected to the criticism and taunts of the Native Americans and to the criticism and taunts of their elders as well. Too often in the classroom, the American schoolmistress regarded them as mere dullards, hardly worthy of her valuable attention. Life at home was hardly more pleasant. Whereas in the schoolroom, they were too foreign at home, they were too American. Even the immigrant father who compromised most willingly in adjusting his outside affairs to the realities that surrounded him insisted that family life, at least, should retain the pattern that he had known as a boy. Language, religion, customs, and parental authority were not to be modified simply because the home had been moved four or 5,000 miles. When the son and the daughter refused to conform, their action was considered a rebellion of ungrateful children for whom so many advantages had been provided. The gap between the two generations was widened and family spirit embittered by repeated misunderstanding. How to inhabit two worlds at the same time was the problem of the second generation. That problem was solved by escape. As soon as he was free economically, an in independence that usually came several years before he was free legally, the son struck out for himself. He wanted to forget everything, the foreign language that left an unmistakable trace in his English speech, the religion that continually recalled childhood struggles, the family customs that should have been the happiest of all memories. He wanted to be away from all physical reminders of early days in an environment so different, so American, that all associates naturally assumed that he was as American as they. <laughs> 
I think actually I, we heard some of that today, <laughs> didn't we? Yeah. yeah. Well, I first came across this reading from Dr. Hansen when I was in seminary, and I was amazed myself at how well he seemed to explain what I observed as a Japanese American. Now, we Japanese took a little bit longer than others. I'll talk about that later. But basically, that trend line seems to have been followed by nearly every group coming to the US. The first generation comes to America with their cultural identity intact. The second generation tries desperately to be American, even to the point of rejecting their parents. Then the third generation, I think Russell said this, the third generation, actually this was hopeful, starts to wonder what they might have lost. Now here's the kicker. This reading came from Dr. Hansen's speech. And can you guess when this was? This speech was to the Augustana Historical Society. It was a Swedish American association in 1938. Hansen was the child of Swedish and Norwegian Lutheran immigrants. And he did much of his research reflecting on his own experience growing up in the immigrant Scandinavian American church. So as you can see, some of our experiences have been shared by many immigrants in the US. Now let me tell you about my experience in the Japanese church. Now I am a child of the church, as I mentioned, I'm a cradle Presbyterian, which makes me a little different than most Japanese Americans. But even among Japanese Christians, I've been told by Japanese American church leaders that my family isn't like typical or normal Japanese. <laughs> But that is actually likely to be true in a few ways, especially. First of all, my Christian roots were planted in Japan back in 1887. Uh, this church, which still stands today, the Tajima family helped Methodist missionaries to start in Shimamura. My father's side came to America so that my grandfather, Kengo Tajima, could go to seminary. Whenever I talk with immigrant pastors, what I actually do is I pretend I'm talking to my grandpa. And actually that works pretty well. After my grandfather, I had two uncles who were pastors and there's one other pastor in my generation. Now that might not mean be so unusual for Koreans, but actually I haven't met another Japanese family with that many pastors. And finally, you see these three men over here. This picture was taken in Italy. My great great grandfather, my grandfather, and my great grandfather lived in Milan, Italy, back in the 1860s for a couple of years. Um, there was a silk industry in Southern Europe that was destroyed in a blight. And so they asked Asians, silk farmers, to come over and reestablish the silk industry. So that's them. One of the things that I think about, though, is be possibly because of that or be the impact of them going to Europe is that my family is considered to be more westernized, more progressive, and maybe because we're so Western, more assertive than most Japanese. Um, so again, I'm from Southern California. I'm like that. <laughs> so this, this is my story, not necessarily all Japanese. But there are some things that most Japanese agree on. For instance, most Japanese Americans, as actually has been mentioned, point to a fairly brief window when Japanese immigrated to America, pretty much between uh, about 1885 and 1924, the Japanese came to Hawaii as plantation workers, that's them up there, and to the West Coast and to the Western states as farm workers, miners, and other laborers. Back then, Japan was a very different country than it is today, and many workers left to find better fortunes in these new lands. And like today, very few Japanese were Christian, but many joined the Christian church, possibly not so much because of their faith, but because it was their way to become enculturated in American society. Because Hawaii was almost exclusively Congregationalist, 
then that's the dominant Christian tradition of Japanese Americans in Hawaii. On the West Coast, the Japanese were evangelized by Methodists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and others. And I, of course, will be focusing on the Japanese Presbyterians who are mostly on the West Coast. And so if I ever say JPC, that's the old Japanese Presbyterian Conference. So as I mentioned, the Japanese were and are mostly not Christian. As you see, um, the Japanese church was largely a domestic mission of the white church. But even now, Japanese are not strong in the Christian faith. This is from 2012 from the Pew Research Center. And so you see that for Japanese, only about a third are Christian. Another third are not, are unaffiliated. And then 25% are Buddhist. By contrast, the Korean Americans are predominantly Christian, and as you see, mostly Protestant. And um, Jane mentioned this, and you probably know about this, about how the missionaries really did facilitate migration to the US for Koreans. So there were more Koreans in Korea coming to the US, and then quite a few more who joined the church once they came to America. Now, again, many Japanese came to the West Coast as laborers, and so that means that they were pretty uneducated, and many of them settled in the rural areas. And so when you think about this, the Japanese Presbyterian churches, there weren't a huge number of them, but many of them were strung along the West Coast, and many of them were in rural areas. Aside from the church in Philadelphia and Chicago, the JPC churches were you see Seattle, Sacramento, but then Salinas, Watsonville, Turlock. You know, they were in farming communities. There were two in Utah. Actually, my family has a connection with them, and they were primarily founded for miners, for Japanese who came as miners. Like other rural communities, and this is again true elsewhere as well, and many immigrant communities, the pastor could be the only educated person or the only person who has connections with the dominant culture. So the church and the immigrant pastor especially plays a critical role for their members, not only spiritually, but in every other way. For instance, my grandfather was in Salt Lake City. He was at a church primarily for minors, and he had to address all kinds of needs. At one point, he even arranged for the legal defense of a mentally challenged Japanese minor who was wrongly accused of murder. But he was the only person who could figure out how to get a lawyer to help him. You probably know that Japanese migration to America then came to a fairly abrupt end. First, there was the Gentlemen's Agreement in 1907 and, um, and then, of course, the 1924 Exclusion Act. Now, by this time, by the time the law was reversed in 1965, Japan was a pretty developed nation, right? And so Japanese had little need to improve their economic status by moving to the US. So most of the generations, most of Japanese Americans traced their roots to Japan back from pre-1920s. And we tend to correlate to the generational movements in the United States. So for instance, the Issei, the first generation, they, were, they correlate to the lost generation, but that's more of a European thing. The Nisei were mostly members of the greatest generation. The Sansei are um, pretty close to the baby boomers. And the Yonsei are usually generation X or millennials. In my observation, these generational characteristics show most strongly with the Nisei and the Sansei. In fact, I would call the Nisei the greatest, greatest generation. The Nisei, the Nisei were everything for Japanese Americans. They lived through the Great Depression. They lived through World War II as Japanese. But they had the added responsibility that 
they were second gen, so they were um, translating for their parents, communicating with the dominant culture. They dealt with the injustice and the heroism of World War II. They were in the camps. They also were the ones who volunteered to fight in Europe. I don't know if you know this history, it's a big proud thing for Japanese, that there was the 100th Battalion and the 442nd Regiment. They were sent to, many of them were recruited out of the camps and sent to Europe, and they became the most decorated division for its size in US military history. The underside of that would be that um, that's because they were sent to the most dangerous battles and they had the highest casualties. After the war, then the Nisei raised the baby boomers and just like in other Americans, the baby boomers were kind of spoiled, right? So we were the comfortable Americans. Now I'm gonna say the unthinkable, but it's important to know this. In the Japanese church, the greatness of the greatest, greatest generation actually became a major problem for the future of the Japanese American church. They took care of everyone for their entire lives, from being children who were helping their parents through the depression and through the migration, the immigration experience, and all the way through. And frankly, they did not know how to hand off leadership to the next generation. And so for Japanese, because of the camps, we're delayed a generation. And so it wasn't until the sansei moved into, into adulthood that they started to get frustrated with the church. What was interesting about that was that the sansei were fairly successful. And so they became leaders in the general society, but they weren't allowed to be leaders in the church. What that meant was they really didn't feel like they could contribute to the future mission of the church. And so they left the Japanese church. And for Japanese, most of them left the church entirely. The Nisei weathered most of the changing attitudes towards race in the United States. As I mentioned, you know, there's the Exclusion Act. Um, the fact that the Nisei were American born did not protect them from racism. They faced much of the same systemic racism that restricted all other people of color. Actually, back then, there was persecution of anyone who was not white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. For instance, um, you all have heard of redlining. There's been a lot of discussion about redlining, um, about how blacks were segregated and put into separate places. Well. In Southern California, the redlining actually impacted a lot of different people. So this meant that in certain neighborhoods, you had some places like Beverly Hills, which was A for green, that means it was all good. But uh, by the way, this comes from um, a 1939 federal government report. This is how they describe the different neighborhoods. So you see that, even in Beverly Hills, there was a slight infiltration of Jewish people. But when you go down the row, you'll notice that they're not just talking about blacks. They're talking about Mexicans, Jews, and Japanese. What this actually meant was that certain neighborhoods were wonderfully diverse because many groups did live together. Though these and other neighborhoods of African Americans and immigrants were considered undesirable by some, they offered opportunity for the diverse peoples to come to know and to care for and to learn from each other. For instance, a favorite story from my family church, which is First Presbyterian Church Altadena, is the friendship between Jackie Robinson and his next door neighbor and his UCLA teammate, Shig Takayama. On road trips, they would room together because none of the white players are gonna room with them. Their families were so close that when the Takayamas were sent to the camp during World War II, the Robinsons watched over their home for them. 
One of the most endearing episodes during World War II grew out of a group of friends who all played basketball at Belmont High in Los Angeles. Ralph Lazo, and Ralph was half Mexican American, half Irish American. He learned from his buddies that they were gonna be sent away to the camps. And he was really troubled by this and you know, didn't know why this was happening to his friends. And so he boarded the train to the camp at Manzanar. And he lived with his friends from May 1942 to August 1944. You see this guy in the striped shirt? That's him. During their exile, many Japanese Americans left some of their belongings in the basements of the churches and white friends and neighbors guarded the property from looting or arson. And pretty much every Japanese um, Buddhist church or Christian church has some place in their history, a picture usually of a white woman. And in the, Pasadena, in the Altadena Pasadena church, it, she actually moved onto the campus of the church during the war to protect it. Now, Japanese Americans in LA, at least, in LA at least, they continued to live in primarily African American neighborhoods. And so there was this continuing opportunity to learn from the neighbors. And I say this because we've been talking a lot about inter, about Asian um, connections, but there really is the opportunity as we learn more about our vulnerability and the injustices that we all share we can share with other races. Here, this is the um, church choir of my parents when my parents were young adults. And Jester Harrison was a very well-known um, composer and choral conductor. You know the song, and it was in Lilies of the Field, I think it was Lilies of the Amen, Amen. That's Jester Harrison, okay. And so he was actually leading their choir um, for a workshop. Now these shining moments don't embrace the impact of governmental and business constraints on civil rights and the freedom of Japanese Americans. Now, of course, the most obvious, and we've already touched on this, is the incarceration of all people of Japanese descent into the remote camps. It was around about 120,000 people living on the West Coast over 60% of the people were US born. And as Jane mentioned, the first generation Issei were not allowed to be citizens. So this effort violated the rights of several Native American nations because many of these camps were established on Indian reservations. Some Japanese churches were even used as civil control centers. I don't think you can see this, but the um, civil control center for downtown LA was the Japanese Union Church. That is um, Union Church of Los Angeles. The reason given um, for the incarceration was of course fear that the Japanese Americans would betray their country in favor of Japan. This is like in the case of my mother, she had never stepped foot out of America, but she was supposed to be loyal to Japan. This logic was complicated by the fact that there were at the same time 150,000 Japanese Americans living in Hawaii, where Pearl Harbor actually had been bombed. But in Hawaii, there was no whole scale evacuation. In fact, there were maybe 1200 to 1800, there was about 1% of the Japanese Americans in Hawaii who were sent to camps. The difference was that the individuals in Hawaii were, and this in some ways, this is more shameful for them because they actually had the FBI go up to individual houses to be arrested. Whereas in California, they were just told, pack up your belongings, bring your babies and board the train. But I don't know if you've noticed that with the Babylonian ex exile, like in the Jeremiah passage, not everybody went, it was just the leaders. And that's what happened in Hawaii. Even after the war, when the Japanese Americans returned home to the West Coast, they faced terrible hatred and discrimination. And so because of this, 
It's hard for me to believe, but actually when people started coming back to California, the white church actually thought that possibly it would help the Japanese to try to merge them into the white churches. The Japanese could not see, however, joining the churches of the people who looked like, and in some cases were, the very people who spat on them and supported their incarceration. So the Japanese churches continued as a separate group. Um, you know, when we were talking about this, about the Korean church and what does it mean to be the Korean church, many ethnic churches do kind of start to not become as distinct. But frankly, as long as there is a need, usually because of racism, then churches are going to continue to stay intact. So it's also, I would contend, that Japanese American Christians were probably relatively compared to other Asians more interested in social justice than other Asian churches. The discrimination that they faced caused some Japanese to, they would attempt to assimilate, maybe with even greater urgency, like they changed, they dropped the Japanese out of all their church names, but they learned that nothing really could make the dominant culture see them as American. Therefore, I, at least, was raised to never confuse being American with being Christian. I believe this discrimination also kept the Japanese church uh, exclusive for that other generation. That's why we kind of like took another generation longer to start to um, rebel. Um, because really the church provides, it's like a, not just a spiritual sanctuary, but a cultural sanctuary. It offers safe space for us to belong to just be. It also offers us a way to overcome discrimination. So remember I was talking about the redlining and this is part of the systemic racism, right? When you have government laws against you or you have businesses who don't trust you. Our family church actually ran a savings and loan association. I was probably one of the last uh, members of the SOGO Savings and Loan Association, and it was run by our church because no bank was going to give them mortgages, so the church arranged for that. One interesting impact of World War II was also, this is interesting, it was kind of like a reversal of pastoral authority. I mentioned, um, you know, like I said, that the church um, dropped Japanese from its names, um, but something else happened the nisei pastors who were essentially the em pastors right the second gen pastors they were made the head of staff or the senior pastor because the uh first gen pastors the japanese pastors they want they wanted the churches to look as american as possible so they made the english pastors the ones who would be kind of on the front now, this is, you know, I've been thinking about doing research on this because this is kind of crazy making, right? <laughs> um, one thing, though, that I know, I know this in my own family, that for the most part, there was still respect shown for the first gen pastor. And actually, there were, in some cases, like family connections between the first and second generation. So the first generation could willingly give up their authority because it was their son in law. I will say, however, that the first church I served in Hawaii, um, I know that in their history, their first generation pastor actually had a breakdown, had an emotional breakdown and had to leave the ministry when he found out that the American born young adults at his church actually com conspired with the incoming EM pastor to become head of staff. Um, that was really tragic. but. In California, at least, there were several where the Issei pastor willingly took the back seat. This is a unique situation, obviously, and it was caused by war. But I'm aware of, a, as I mentioned, that there are a couple of Korean churches where the first gen pastor made himself either co-pastor or made a point of giving leadership opportunities to the whole church. Um, 
And I actually think that the churches benefited greatly from that. I've seen this with other immigrant churches um, where the church, for whatever reason, would um, clearly from the very beginning invite people into visible forms of leadership. And so the young people don't really feel like they have to leave because they're actually being given these great opportunities within the church. This may be an issue for Presbyterians because, you know, Presbyterians were all about leadership development. So, you know, that may be part of it too. Anyway, after World War II, as I mentioned, the Japanese church grew as the baby boom grew. So while the third generation, the Sansei, we were children, we were happy to be in the Japanese church. That's what we knew. The Nisei, we were, it was even better for us because our parents were American born. And so they were speaking English and most of the activities of the church were held in English. Um, there were a lot of Sansei who actually went to Japanese on Saturdays, but the churches were pretty comfortable. However, as the baby boomer and Sansei, they grew into adulthood, they presented several significant challenges to the Japanese church. And I'd suggest that these are similar issues for um, most immigrant children or most immigrant churches. First, the Sansei, they are, they're pretty thoroughly American. They, we, even if we try to pretend otherwise, we kind of think like Americans. We have similar expectations and we're pretty comfortable in American society. We don't have so much of the need for that cultural sanctuary because we're pretty comfortable wherever we go. We share many of the values of our dominant culture neighbors, whether we like to admit it or not. And we even enjoy some success in our professions and in our social circles. And what this means is that we don't need church to be the one safe place where we can belong, where we can be respected, speak our language, eat our food without having to explain ourselves. When the church loses that central role as community center, substitute family, cultural sanctuary, American members, American born members will look for something more from the church, whether it be dynamic and inspiring worship, relevant preaching and teaching for their generation, compelling mission beyond the church, whatever it all is, and like I said, the opportunity to lead, they demand more. It's ironic. And wherever, whereas the church might be the one place where new immigrants can be leaders, the immigrant church sometimes is the last place where an American born younger adult can take leadership. In the case of the Japanese church, the Sansei acted just like other baby boomers. If the church wasn't going to give them what they were seeking, they'd leave. That's what they did. By the way, this presents um, very practical challenges as well as in passing. The Issei and the Nisei were very loyal to their church and they dedicated not only their time, but also their financial resources to support the church because it was so important, right? It was her community, it was family, it was everything. The Sansei, not so much. The Sansei have plenty of other options for community, for church, and for the use of their time and treasure. And so the giving patterns of later generations are not as solid and reliable as that of the people closer to the immigrant experience. And it's important not to assume that that's just because they're lazy or unreliable, <laughs> but it's just they've got other things going on. Their giving might begin to look like the dominant culture members but they can be generous if they feel that the church is relevant and listening. There have been, there's been another phenomenon that um, has greatly impacted the Japanese church and that is intermarriage. It was maybe 20 or 30 years ago when we in the Japanese American community, we kind of realized that um, Japanese were marrying non-Japanese more than they were marrying other Japanese. We are now reaching the point, in fact, where Japanese Americans who are multiracial will outnumber the number of Japanese only people in America. The most natural way, therefore, that Japanese churches become multiracial <laughs> was because their members kept marrying other races. Now, I'm guessing that Koreans will take this path also. In 
2009, uh, there were two authors, Pyong Gap Min and Chikon Kim, and they wrote an analysis using US census data from 2001 to 2006. And they found that among US born Korean Americans who were born after 1965, that sounds very specific, that constitutes 77% of Koreans in America. Okay, and you see this, 46% are marrying Koreans, but 40% marrying whites, 8% marrying other Asians, and 6% are marrying other races. Okay. Now, Japanese and Koreans, right? You know, I hear people kind of sigh. <laughs> Because traditionally, we're as homogeneous as anyone, right? But clearly, intermarriage is a dominant trait for you as four nations. So this is going to be a question. How does the church respond to multiracial families? I once had the revealing conversation with LA Union Church. Um, it was really interesting because they were presented with this great opportunity to sponsor a new worship service, but it was going to attract a lot of other people, <laughs> a lot of non-Japanese. And they were really uneasy about this. But I had this aha moment and I was talking to them and I said, well, all of you have non-Japanese in your families. And they do. And what we realized is that their ability to welcome non-Japanese into their families could give them some lessons on how to welcome them into the church. Because it's not just about all of these strangers coming in and taking over. When a non-Japanese would enter into a family, for instance, usually there's going to be like somebody, usually the spouse, who will like train them. <laughs> Right? Say, this is this is what this means, this is what you have to do, this is how you have to act, and you know, that kind of thing. So they'll like train them how to understand the tradition, how to respect people, how to respect the values of the families. And the families, of course, will be loving and patient and flexible. But it really is kind of a dual way of looking at this. So for example, someone like the Japanese spouse would tell them about New Year's right new year's traditions and foods the food table started to look more diverse it wasn't just sushi there would be like tamales and galbi on it i mean there would be like different things there but that doesn't mean that they lose the sushi or the lucky mochi actually what would happen is the newcomers learned how to eat mochi <laughs> and everyone enjoyed that um, but it became this multi-ethnic multicultural table so where are we now in the Japanese church? I have to tell you that the Japanese churches, yeah, maybe this is why it was so poignant, because it's for decades now we've been trying to figure out what the future of the Japanese church is. Um, pretty much they all have survived, but they survive, I would say, through God's will manifested in a mixture of grace and stubbornness. The grace comes from the generosity of the prior generations the steward, and also the stewardship of the Nisei. God's grace couples with Japanese stubbornness in the care and the benefits of the property the church's own. Take, for instance, the Salt Lake City Church. This is a church that worships in the same tiny building that my father grew up in a century ago. I went to visit, it was probably the last road trip I took with my father. And so I went there and I was shocked. I realized they are 50, a 15 minute walk from the Mormon tabernacle. And they're across the street from Vivint Arena where the Utah Jazz play. And so it was amazing to me that the city would preserve this little slice of Japanese history. The Buddhist temple was at the other end of the block. And, and I thought, man, you know, like any other city would have just condemned this property or like pushed them out somehow. But because of this, the um, parking lot that was next to the Christian church, which by the way, if you know Luke Choi, that's how I first knew Luke Choi, because he was the pastor of that church for a while. Um, that church was financially pretty stable because they rented out their parking lot to the Vivint Arena on a regular basis. So the grace of the prior generations to settle there and the stubbornness of the people to just stick it out, um, I'm sure, that's uh, how they've been able to survive all this time. <laughs>
But as the Japanese church is moving for, into its fourth and fifth generations, we struggle. But we see a few glimpses of hope. One challenge for the Japanese church has been how to welcome non-Japanese without feeling marginalized in their own church. The Japanese uh, traditionally have struggled to articulate their faith, especially in the face of non-Japanese, especially Westerners. Because Westerners have this way of just assuming that if you're not from Europe or your heritage isn't from Europe, then you must not really understand Christianity all that well. And this is really too bad because I, as I've mentioned, you know, I think there are gifts that the Japanese church can offer, just as every culture has the ability to reflect different aspects of the gospel. For instance, as the fourth generation Yonsei are now adults, they and the many Sansei are able to express their faith through their art. Um, they're very involved in visual arts, in drama, and in music. The Japanese ability to defer individual gratification um, is in um, and how we will, you know, we're communitarian like most Asians are. And so we will defer our needs for the collective body of Christ. And for me, that's a really helpful demonstration to the Western church about John's assertion that Jesus must increase and I must decrease. And I believe that the Asian appreciation for our place in all of creation can make to be, be make us all to be better caretakers of the earth, which is another issue that Western cultures are just coming in to realize. Even as I suggest these gifts, I do not believe that the people of the Japanese church recognize this. And this is a major vulnerability because now most of the pastoral leaders of Japanese churches are not Japanese. Of the 16 Japanese Presbyterian churches, they are led by nine white people, two Korean Americans, two other Asians, and four Japanese. And by the way, all of them are men, except for one white woman and one Japanese woman. And it's not that Japanese American women do not go into ministry. But the church's unwillingness to call them to be their pastors leaves whatever gifts Japanese Americans may have in ministry, it leaves them to be offered to non-Japanese churches or regional administration or seminaries. This is an issue that most Asian churches face, with the exception of the Indonesian church. But most Asian churches just don't call their own women into pastor leadership. Because the future of the Japanese church depends on welcoming non-Japanese into membership, then it's my hope that the traditions and the gifts and the cultural identity of the Japanese church do not get lost or stepped on by the newcomers. And so if a pastor is not Japanese, and many of them will not be, my hope is that they have the cultural sensitivity and an open mind, and that the members can teach the pastor with patience what is precious and faithful about the Japanese church tradition. Every culture, every culture has gifts to offer the church. Koreans so much more than the Japanese. The depth of the Bible knowledge, the roots, the deep roots in faith, the passion and devotion to Jesus Christ, the sacrificial giving, the time commit of time and treasure, the ability to evangelize and welcome new members. These are all just a few of the gifts of the Korean church that I've noticed and that I've told other people that they should learn. As a church welcomes people from outside their culture, which at some point you may need to do, it's important to celebrate and teach the gifts of your church. There is no need for a dominant culture person to come in and to mold your church into a copy of theirs. In fact, that would be a loss for the wider church. So as the Jeremiah prophecy tells us, let us settle into this new land because we will likely be in this land for at least a few generations. And we might as well contribute to this strange land, including expanding mission and opening the church to more diverse members, even through intermarriage. As the Babylonian exiles were told, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, give your daughters a marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, 
multiply there and do not decrease. You do not decrease by mixing into the, into the culture more. And finally, perhaps more importantly and most importantly, open your church to the leadership and the vision of the next generations. This message is not just for the first generation, by the way. It's surprising how fast the third and uh, future generations will rise up, but might not realize that the fifth and sixth generations have something new to offer too. Trust that you have formed their faith well, that God has claimed them, that they know well the importance of prayer and listening for God's guidance, and that God continues to watch over them. They do have gifts to share the gospel with those who do not yet know Jesus. Remember, you all were called and sent to spread the good news, to be a hopeful glimpse of the kingdom, and to be the hands and heart of Christ, not just for your own members, but for the world. Know your spiritual gifts, not only as individuals, but as a church and as a church tradition, and appreciate what God can do through you. And even when this changing world makes us wonder whether there is a future, let us remember the assurances of God who says, for surely I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you a future with hope. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful challenge at the end for all of us to take into our hearts. Uh, just a couple of announcement. So tomorrow morning, if you are checking out of hotel tomorrow, before you come to the church, you do need to pack and bring your stuff here because checkout time is at 11 o'clock. You will not be able to go back. We'll give all the rise uh, information and all those kind of things tomorrow morning. And we'll make sure you arrive at Denver Airport two hours before your flight because Denver is now the third busiest airport in the world. Uh, so we'll make sure we'll do that. So please remember to check out those of you guys who are staying until Thursday. You know, you don't need to <laughs> do anything and such. So um, tonight, change of plans because uh, no one signed up to go to the Chinese restaurant and everybody wants to go to downtown. Uh, so we are actually going to send all three vans to downtown. Um, so you could go there and then you could either take the light rail back. If you're taking the right rail back from the Union Station, which is where you're going to be dropped off in downtown, it's a Bellevue Station. Uh, you could take it back or you could, if you find three, four, five, you could Uber, Uber X, XL, you could uh, take it back straight to the hotel or talk to your van drivers about uh, coming back with them um, as well. Uh, so the we'll all go to the hotel now. The vans will leave at 4.30. There are a few people who signed up to go to Korean restaurant. Um, if you could talk to Kim Su-young Moksanim, um, who is back there, uh, he'll be at the hotel lobby. If you could talk to him, um, he's going to hook you up with uh, Kim Eun-ju Gyosunim, who is going to take you to the Korean restaurant if you want to go there. There is, Korean there is a Korean restaurant in downtown area as well. There, here, like one Korean restaurant owner owns like six or seven different restaurants. So um, it's all part of that network. Uh, and Union Station has a lot of cool ice cream shops and all those little cafes and a lot of fun things to do. 16th Street Mall, that's a street like you could walk forever. <laughs> so. Have fun, it's a uh, wonderful weather. And if you are in a hotel, just check around the hotel. There's a lot of neat things. So we'll see you all back tomorrow morning, bright and early. Thank you. Thank you.